harmony in diversity. When it comes to Asian culture, it's not just a slogan, it's a way of life, and it's easy to see why. Here in the East, we're home to some of the world's oldest civilizations, and the effect these cultures and customs have had on the world at large is huge. But how do these civilizations coexist? To what extent do they promote harmony in diversity? Or do they just jostle and tussle for top spot as each civilization seeks to find its place in the modern world? The Conference on Dialogue of Asian Civilizations is taking place right here in Beijing. Its aims to promote exchanges among different peoples so that even though their cultures may be very diverse, these civilizations can tackle some of the major issues of today with one voice. Here in the studio, representatives from three of the world's oldest civilizations. Wang Hui is representing China. He's professor of literature and history in the School of Humanities at Tsinghua University. Sudindra Kulkarni is the founder of Forum for a New South Asia, and he's batting for India. And representing Europe, you've got me. I'm Jeff Moody. This is Dialogue. Wang Hui, let's start with you, if we may. How do we define, do you think, a civilization? For instance, what's the difference between me talking about Chinese civilization and the Chinese people? As this is a, not easy to define the concept of civilization. Of course, we find a lot of the definitions of that. But it could be thought as a way of life. It could be of the whole bond of the cultures in the certain kind of the location. I think that the idea, the people now raise the issue of civilizations actually show that uh, how diversify or the how diversity, how much diversity in uh, our everyday life. So that became a kind of the civilization. I mean, culture obviously plays a big yes. part of it. And you, you see that very much in China. You see cultural traditions that go back 3,000 years, you yes. know, the, the writing being a classic example of that. Um, but also, how much does ethnicity play a part? Because the Han Chinese as a yes. group, as a tribe, yeah. are very tight and very strong. On the other hand, you can see, look for a thousand years, the Han Chinese is also the, let's say, it's a complex. It's a so many different kind of ethnic groups, tribes meeting together and following certain kind of the cultures. So sometimes I thought the Chinese civilization or Chinese culture as a category was bigger than the uh, like uh, Confucianism, Taoism and so on and so forth. So you can find a lot of the different uh, cultures which like uh, Buddhism from India now became part of the Chinese culture. So any kind of the civilizations always contain the traces of other civilizations. In that sense, the idea of civilization or civilizations always means a certain kind of the openness. So, Jinji Kulkarni, to what extent can a civilization be watered down by historical events? I'm talking specifically in India about the, sorry about this, the British that came in to your country not that long ago. Does, does, does an outside force water down a civilization, do you feel? Uh, first of all, uh, in introducing me, you said that I'm batting for India. Uh, I'm, of course, batting for India, but I'm batting for Asia, and I'm batting for the world civilizations, because I respect all civilizations, just as uh, I respect my own civilization. But you see, I'm a journalist, so I, I, I'm, bound to want to I'm bound to want to create some conflict here. Which civilization is the best? No, no, no. You know, I want to go back. I want to go back to a, a very seminal speech that President Xi Jinping delivered at UNESCO in Paris in 2014 in which he said that all civilizations are equal, a profound statement. So your question, which civilization is the best, which civilization <laughs> is superior, no, all civilizations in the world are equal but and all civilizations are inclusive and that answers your question about uh, Britain having influenced India. You see, no civilization is an island in the world. Yeah, right. Every civilization, as Professor mentioned, influences the other and is in turn influenced by other civilizations. At the same time, every civilization retains its own personality. So let's look at those personalities then. How, for instance, do, does 
Indian civilization, the personality of, of India, if you like, H how is it similar to the personality of China, the, the Chinese civilization, bearing in mind how close these two nations are? Yeah, you know, it's a very interesting question. Uh, we are two neighboring civilizations, and uh, we have influenced each other in very profound ways over the last 5,000 years. The common signature tune of the two, two civilizations is unif unity in diversity or harmony in diversity. Yes. In India, we have a, a foundational saying called Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, which means the entire world is one family. Now, the same is reflected in China. Uh, it is called Tianxia Detong if I have pronounced yes, it properly, right. yes. all yes. under yes. heaven, <laughs> all under the heaven, <laughs> all under the heaven right. are one people. Yeah. Now similarly, you know, in Chinese civilization, there's a very profound thinking in the Chinese civilization that there is some, you, you know, commonness in heaven, nature, and mankind. Tian Ren Hei, cosmos, nature, and mankind. Yeah. The same is reflected in our own wisdom. That is yat pinde, tat brahmande. What is in me is in the universe, and what is in the universe is in me. <laughs> now, this means that each has a certain personality, but it is common it, to all the human beings, all the human societies, all the human civilizations around the world. You know, it's, it's something very profound that in nature, there is diversity, there is no uniformity, there is so much of diversity which is part of the architecture of nature. The same diversity is also in human societies, but if you, if you look deeper, we are one in some very mysterious ways, and we have to recognize and celebrate that oneness. Absolutely, we do indeed. Yeah. Wong, Wong Hui, um, where did this, this link that's been beautifully described by Mr. Yes. Kulgani, the, the, yeah. the, the similarities between yeah. uh, Chinese culture and Indian culture, um, I'm presuming the, the time when they, they merged in this way was, was, goes back to the Silk Road. How influential do you think the Silk Road was back in the day in marrying these two civilizations together? There's a long history, right? That uh, from Weijin <coughs> dynasties, Tang dynasties, so many monks traveled to India to search for the real classics, uh, the real truths for that. So by nature, I agree with that. The so-called oneness by nature is multiple. And in that sense, it's so different. But on the other hand, you can share a lot of things together. And also, it's interesting, like Buddhism came from India. However, localized and uh, sinicized. Here, that uh, we, we talk about the Chinese Buddhism, but it's not, of course, the Chinese Buddhism we contain so many, so many elements, inspirations from Indian cultures. But on the other hand, that's even the Xuanzang and the others, whose travelers to India had huge impact on India history. So that's, I think, the shared knowledge. But it's not necessarily means that we are the homogeneous. No, it's not homogeneous, it's not the same. We are quite uh, diversified in a sense. We are very different. But that difference for us is not the, uh, let's say, it's not preventing us, prevent us from the communication. Somehow the, uh, the difference were the starting point for our communication. I think this is uh, the real issue. And uh, when you go back to your early question about civilization or the civilizations, I think on the one hand, the concept itself is comprehensive, the civilization. But on the other hand, uh, why we often need to talk about uh, like a clash of civilizations and uh, so on and so forth, partly because during the 19th century, especially colonial time, that the concept itself underwent a process of racialization. So even people still feel not really easy to get rid of the shadows of that kind of the racism or colonialism. So made that category of civilization more inclusive, more rich, and more open, to some extent still bound to the early history to think about this issue. 
So sometimes I use a term, maybe in English, uh, strange. I often describe one society, like China and India, as a trans transystemic society. The systemic means different language, different religion, religious beliefs, different cultures, however, which compose one society. But on the other hand, when we talk about the Silk Road, it's like a line link all the societies together, which can be thought as a trans societal system that uh, which overlaps each other. So in that sense, you can argue that it's one or multiplicity. So both are the same. You're, you're talking sense. about the, the, the links between China and India, um, culture-wise, civilization-wise, um, ideas-wise. Is this just a geographical similarity? For instance, my civilization, the West, Europe, can that be part of your civilizations? Can, can we influence you and can you influence us? Of course, we have influenced uh, each other in some fundamental ways in the past. But this mutual interaction and influence has got accelerated in modern times with mobility of people, with technology, with trade, and the world becoming one. And therefore, more and more, we are talking of a common destiny, a common future for mankind, for all civilizations contributing to each other. Take, for example, Britain. You know, Britain colonized India. But, uh, of course, we fought Britain and we won independence. But uh, in the process, we have inherited so much from Britain, including the mm. language, mm. English. And, and, Very soon, and customs. You know, we will have the largest number of English-speaking people in the world. Already we have more English people, people, English-speaking people than Britain. So, <laughs> you know, this cricket. Is, we gave you cricket. Of course. <laughs> huh? So, point is, that uh, over the centuries, all, all civilizations, you know, Silk Road was mentioned here. You know, the earliest description of China in Indian classics is the land of silkworm, the land of silk. That is China, China Bhumi. That is how India described yeah. China. Hmm? So, uh, if, with your permission, I would like to show you a very uh, significant book on the India-China civilizational link. It's called Himalaya Calling, The Origins of China and India ah, okay. by Professor Tan Chung, one of the yeah. greatest uh, yeah. scholars of China. And he was the son of Professor Tan Yun Shan. Tan Yun Shan was himself a legendary scholar yeah. who was influenced by our great poet, Rabindranath Tagore, yeah. who is equally respected yes. in China. So, Rabindranath Tagore established an institution called China Bhavan, the House of China, in his university and invited Professor Tan Yun Chang. Now, Tan Yun Chang, you know, these are the people who have gone deep into the civilization links between India and China. Tagore, Tan Yun Shan, Tan Chung, Professor Ji Xian Lin, a great scholar, yeah. whom we also regard as a great guru. Yeah. Now, we have to, and of course, Xunjiang, the great explorer, who over a thousand years, on foot, he traveled across mountains and uh, deserts and brought the, the, uh, the treasure of Indian knowledge. But as he said, it was sinicized. It was made into Chinese asset, which is very now very different from India. And in modern times, as our former Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru said, that in modern times, India has to learn a lot from China. So this is the kind of confluence. <laughs> I want to make one thing clear, that many Western scholars have been talking about clash of civilizations. No, there is no clash of civilizations. Well, there is a confluence of civilizations. Wonderful. There is a dialogue of civilizations. Well, there is indeed, and dialogue matters. We will get on to the clash uh, versus conflagration of civilizations in just a couple of seconds, but we need to take a, a quick break now. Do stay with us when we'll find out more about India and China and how the civilizations fit into the world at large.
Welcome back. I'm talking to Wong Hui and Sudindra Kulkarni about uh, Asia, Asian civilization in America, the ultimate example of protectionism. And you've got mm -hmm. here in China the ultimate, ultimate example of globalization mm -hmm. with, with President Xi Jinping introducing the Belt and Road Initiative to try and merge cultures, to try and make civilizations talk to each other. How much is what this conference that we're talking about, this dialogue of Asian civilization, how much is that politicized by um, modern, the modern world, by modern life? Is this a political thing? Broadly speaking, it's everything. Culture could be political. In that sense, it's political. They say that the issue of Asia or the Asia integration was the 20th century product during the colonial time. So, for example, in the early 20th century, the Chinese scholar intellectual, exile intellectual, the Zhang Taiyan, who was a very important philosopher, he also promotes the idea of the so-called the equality of all things, including that the peoples and the natures and the different peoples. So, he, so at that time, he worked together with the Indian friends together with some other Asian, some intellectuals from other or the overseas revolutionaries will work together for organize an uh, organ which called the, the, the Asian Society for Intimacy. So in that sense, because of the uh, colonialism, imperialism at that time, that kind of the cultural linkage itself could be thought as a political. This is the one aspect. Second, I think that uh, we know that uh, from a long history that uh, w all the knowledge about ourselves to some extent reshaped by 19th, 20th century European knowledge. So that's why the people know little. Though we, on the one hand, we have the very profound long history for the communication. We learn so much from India, Persia, and other uh, civilizations and uh, cultures. <coughs> but on the other hand, in, in the modern period, we learn from the West, which we learn so much from that. But the limitations of that knowledge now become more problematic. So we need to know more each other and uh, to have a more dense conversation and a dialogue. So that's, I think, it's uh, important. I think there's nothing wrong with learning from other civilizations as long yeah. as that, that learning isn't forced upon you, yeah. like, unfortunately, we, the Brits, have done in many, many occasions over the years, as have other European nations. But um, you, you were talking, Sudhindra, about, uh, you were saying there's no clash of civilizations. That's a very different view to what the Americans have, isn't it? You know, as Professor mentioned, Something uh, fundamental happened in the 18th, 19th, 20th centuries. The West has played a dual role in the evolution of civilizations. On the one hand, it has given a lot to the rest of the world in terms of modern science, technology, etc. At, at the same time, the history of colonialism, neocolonialism, and Traces of imperialism even now yes. have given a certain sense of superiority to the West. They think that they are superior and that superiority has to be maintained at all costs. So there are two types of globalization. There is globalization and anglobalization. <laughs> hmm? uh, you know, the difference is, <laughs> you know, so don't take it, uh, uh, don't uh, take it wrong because you are at least, you know, just uh, you're born there, but you, you, of course, belong to the world now. But anglobalization, the Anglo version of globalization, the Western sense of globalization is that the West has some essential superiority, yes. which is now manifesting itself in protectionism as against the voices from Asia. The voices from Asia are talking of true globalization in which the Asia is not saying we are superior, China is yeah. not saying we are superior, India is not saying we are superior, but we have to live together. That's the meaning of building a community of common future for the entire mankind. Xi Jinping's you know, wise words, there is no other leader in the world who is talking of a common future for the entire mankind. No clash of civilization, learning from each other. So Wong Kui, how do we go about doing that? 
The first of all, let, let's see the clash and the contradiction conflicts is nowadays everywhere. You can see that. We need to rethink about the, what's the real roots of that. Was the culture or civilizations or some others? For example, the, the one term was emerged in the late 19th century, early 20th century, geopolitical concern, was really played a big role in the international relations. And uh, now the, a lot of the protectionism is a civilizational issue or the economic or the political, geopolitical issues. So we need to think, to do some uh, uh, clarify. Maybe I think that the, the Huntington, for example, is Huntington's thesis based on his understanding or interpretation of European, Euro or the American history. And you have, if you look at the European history, you have the, the religious wars and so on and so forth. These kind of the issues made people thought that the, 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 the civilization is inevitable to be in clash, I think. But here, at least in China, I didn't see these kind of the religious wars. And no okay. such things. At, and so we, we need to do the analyze more accurately what's the historical roots for the clash and the conflicts. On the one hand, we know we have to face these kind of the clash and the uh, conflicts, but how to define that? But I think you, 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 you put your, your finger on it there, because religion yeah. plays a major part in civilizations. Yes. Civilizations are based on religions, yes. going right back to the beginning. That's where your thought, that's where your ideas come from. Um, they're fundamental to civilizations. But a lot of religions in the world, most of the religions in the world, talk about, um, have the understanding that our religion is the best, there is only one God, it's our God, and we have to convert other people to our cause. So, whilst religions form civilizations and are very fundamental to the growth of civilizations, they also destroy them as well, don't they? Most of uh, the civilizational wisdom and uh, wealth is contained, in my opinion, in the religions of the world. And it is not a coincidence that almost all great religions of the world are born in Asia. Hmm? Yeah. And they spread from Asia to the rest of the world, whether it's Judaism, Christianity, yes. Islam, and of course Hinduism in the in the past, all born in Asia. And I am in some ways proud of the fact that I belong to a nation, India, which is home to all religions of the world. And all religions of the world are, are considered by our constitution and also by our culture as equal. There is no superiority of any, any religion. And that's a misinterpretation. And out of that misinterpretation comes acts of violence and terrorism which are completely against the fundamental teachings of every religion. Therefore, when we talk of civilizational dialogue, there is also a need for a dialogue among religions of the world, inter-religious dialogue at all levels, both among scholars, religious leaders and also common people. Because terrorism and extremism in the name of God and religion has uh, become a main threat to world peace. And that's never been more important than it is now. Th than it is now. And therefore, we have to go back to all those teachers and philosophers from Confucius to Buddha and Mahatma Gandhi, Prophet Muhammad himself, Prophet Jesus, they all preach the oneness of humanity. And here, especially in the context of India-China dialogue, I would like to say the profound words of the father of our nation, Mahatma Gandhi, you know, in 1942, he wrote to a, a leader of China, said that India and China, I long for the day when India and China live together as brothers and friends for their own good, for the good of Asia and for the good of the entire world. So the man of peace, Mahatma Gandhi saying this, and that is a common teaching of India and China, and that's the common teaching of all the religions. Maybe I could add that uh, the political culture in Chinese civilization or Chinese history is so important because we used to say that, that the Confucianism, but actually the Confucianism on the, the 
transformation from long history assimilated different elements from other cultures, which, the politically speaking, they can hold different religions and cultures together, didn't downplay one to other. So that's why in everyday life, you can see that a lot of the scholars, Confucian scholars, they are also believers of the Buddhists. They are also the Buddhist believers, and so on and so forth. So it didn't see that, uh, of course, that uh, in, in the Chinese case, we have no such like a monoethic aesthetic the passion. This is not uh, very different from. So the coexistence, I think, that uh, in <laughs> the Asian uh, the cultures were much more important, as you mentioned at the beginning, to talk about the so-called harmony in diversity, in Chinese case, it's really like that, more inclusiveness. That was also, the, that is the, uh, in everyday life. I came across many people in different regions, one family with different ethnicities. They are married because they're, one of my friends, they had the family with the four ethnicities living together peacefully. For individual one families, it's the case. For the village and the large community, it could be the case. If we can all work together, there'll be peace throughout the world. But the reality is a lot of people won't work together. A lot of nationalities won't work together. A lot of leaders won't work together. How do you think um, initiatives like the Dialogue of Asian Civilizations, how do you think initiatives like the Belt and Road um, can tackle those problems, can get everybody on board? Because unless everybody is on board, there's a limit to what can be achieved. I think that the first of all, as a scholar in the universities, I think that, that we really need to change our knowledge. Because basically, what prevents us for this kind of communication, as you said, that we identify ourselves and yourself in that way. We need to rethink about this kind of the way of thinking, to think about that. Talking about the Belt Rose Initiative, the four concepts, well, for me, is like a belt, roads, corridors, and the bridges were all about the interconnections. It was not about the totality and for the dominance. So in that sense, quite long ago, we, uh, the uh, Japanese thinker, Takeuchi Yoshimi, raised the issue of so-called Asia as method, which not necessary. I think, that of course, they are quit, uh, qu it's a critique of the Eurocentrism the, in the social science humanities. But on the other hand, it's not the Asian centralism because that method by nature was relational. It's about the inter interconnections. Okay, well in half an hour we've, we've virtually solved the world's problems. <laughs> uh, we're now all one civilization. We started off competing against each other half an hour ago and here we are as one. Uh, Wong Hui and Sidindra Kulkarni, thank you both very much indeed for a fascinating chat. Thank you, thank you very thank much. You. And that's it from this edition of Dialogue. Thank you very much for watching. I'm